Brent Riffle, and I'm part of the team, uh, uh, along with uh, International Services and Programs, um, that's uh, put together this uh, week-long forum, uh, the International Forum on Youth. This is our second year, uh, and this is our second presentation of the week's uh, events. Um, we have uh, another event after this uh, at 5 p.m. today. Uh, Dr. Reagan Ramali um, will speak about the importance of the community college experience, and she's going to give uh, insights into her own firsthand account of opening uh, a community college um, in the Middle East. Uh, so please join us for that at this same uh, address, Zoom address. Uh, but now I'm really pleased to introduce Tim Honadel, uh, who is uh, currently uh, at, here at College of the Canyons, the director of ISP, International Services and Programs. He is a lifelong educator, um, and he has um, uh, worked in dozens of countries around the world um, on environmental sustainability and compliance issues, uh, both in uh, government, nonprofit, education, and industry. Um, and I'm really interested to see what he brings to us today. He, 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 if, you, if you know Tim, he's got an, a really curious mind and, and really um, a wide ranging thinker. So uh, I'm looking forward to his talk today. Um, I'm going to be moderating the chat. Um, so if you have questions, um, please write them in the chat and then we'll certainly save time at the end to walk through any questions anyone has. Um, and with that, uh, I'll, I'll uh, leave it to Tim. Okay, I'll uh, go ahead and get started sharing the screen. So migration is a big topic. Uh, this week, there are topics of migration of people, ideas, germs, and today we're going to talk about the migration of species. Specifically, the point of the presentation is not so much a cataloging of invasive species, but that there are certain conditions that must be followed or the hab uh, habitability of the planet will change. Typically, this presentation elicits a fleet of comments and sharing. Um, in the Zoom world, this may be less, we'll see, but I still have left plenty of time for discussion at any point in the presentation. You don't have to wait until the end. And I promise you, this is not going to get preachy like so many environmental presentations. It's a particularly clinical point of view. So the migration of species around the globe. Uh, this is really a story that's as old as commerce. And before we get started, there's a couple of ground rules. Um, the first one is the earth is old. If you believe the earth is 3,783 years old, this presentation is not going to work for you. Also dinosaurs are real. Uh, life evolves through DNA. There are natural cycles. There are natural uh, old cycles and warm cycles, sunspots and things like that. And at this point, if there's any other rules we want to add to this list or discuss, now is the time to do it. So there's three system conditions and we'll get to those system conditions specifically in a minute with the focus on system condition number three, which is the species one. But generally the concept is that life on this planet, the way we know it, developed because of a compliance with those three system conditions. All of the conditions specify gradual change. Rapid change is disruptive and causes a down cycling in natural complexity. Now there have been rapid changes, certainly in the history. If uh, those who understand about the Yucatan Peninsula and the meteor that hit and how that changed the course of life on the planet, it's a perfect example of a rapid change. So, Condition number one, and we'll just go over number one and number two very briefly, but number one is about the substances extracted from beneath the Earth's crust. And talking about condition one helps with the understanding of what a system condition is. So we'll just start with it, and then the others will start to make a lot of sense. Um, so sidebar to describe this concept, all of the system conditions are about a systematic and rapid change that is the that creates a problem with compliance with the system conditions. So throughout history, change is relatively slow unless human factors are included. Then sometimes it changes fast. And we also can have natural fast changes like a meteor. Um, otherwise adaptation requires a very, very slow change. Uh, ice ages are considered a rapid change. So they do cause significant disruption. So let's revisit number one. 
through that lens of slow change. In a sustainable society, nature is not subject to systematically increasing substances extracted from the Earth's crust. So you kind of see how we did that. We said system condition number one is about substances extracted from the Earth's crust, and all the system conditions together are what create a sustainable society and that there's some sort of a systematic effect. So examples, sand is on the surface, oil is beneath the surface, both have been around for a very long time, and each has a different effect on the environment and on life when it is brought to the surface, whether it's naturally brought to the surface in the form of say a tar pit, or whether it's extracted and part of a petroleum product, oil is something which has not been part of the ecosystem above the Earth's crust for the millions of years of evolution. So you get kind of how the system conditions work. So system condition number two is very easy. It's system conditions produced artificially. So system condition number two, a sustainable society, nature is not subject to systematically increasing substances produced by society. Examples, dioxin polychlorinated biphenyls, DDT, microplastics. So let's get on to number three, because that's why we're really here. Number three is about species. And so at this point, typically I ask, um, can anyone give an example of a famous species issue? They're in the news all the time. Everybody's heard of one or the other if they think about it, usually if they get reminded. But there's a lot of things that you read in the newspapers even today. So this isn't something that happened in the background. And it's not just simply, you know, cutting down too many trees like in the picture or rainforest degradation. There's all kinds of stories about species migrations. So in a sustainable society, nature is not subject to systematically increasing the physical degradation of natural processes. So now is when we're really getting into system condition number three, and this is where the migration of species comes in and eventually why it's in IFI, the International Forum on Youth. So system condition number three is about the robustness and resilience of natural systems. That is the characteristic of diversity, right? So it's that degradation of natural systems. And migration, why are we even talking about this as part of migration? And you know, you might think that this rapid migration would be good because if diversity is what you want for system condition number three, then let's bring in lots more species and add diversity. But this rapid migration of species, instead of just around the edges, slowly moving in and around over time, causes the degradation of natural systems. And we'll get to why that happens in a minute. So, but first let's look at some invasive species that, that everybody's heard of, you know, ice plant to eels. So this displacement of native species is a known problem. Uh, it leaves systems devoid of diversity and it's a cascade effect that happens and it causes this down cycling from, for example, from forest to desert. And you see that in desert desertification. Also migration of species can cause major disruptions. I mean, look at the COVID-19 problem we have right now. So if you see on the left, there's a man seen dumping bags of eels into a lake. There's a lot of invasive species that are pets turned loose all over the world. Uh, if you move up kind of going Clockwise, you can see uh, zebra mussels. They're blocking channels uh, for water all over the United States. They're almost impossible to control unless you physically bore holes and then they just grow right back. Uh, the Mediterranean fruit fly. So I'm young enough to remember when the Mediterranean fruit flies were invading the San Fernando Valley and we had helicopters at night flying overhead spraying malathion across the entire San Fernando Valley to try to protect the orange crop. And I 
what I remember from that, besides the uh, fake news about damaging the paint on your car, uh, that that the birds went away. So the San Fernando Valley at this time, there was virtually no birds. And there used to be a lot of different species. So we were left with crows and pigeons. And basically, Malathion kills every insect. And if you kill the insects, you leave it so there's nothing for the birds to eat. And the birds die or go away. And so by having to address this one species, it changed the bird ecosystem in the San Fernando Valley permanently. And uh, the diversity was went way down. If you move a little bit to the right, you can see ice plant. Ice plant was used by the Department of Transportation all across the United States as a slope stabilizer. Uh, unfortunately, it's an invasive species. And so it doesn't just stay on the slopes. And also, incidentally, when it rains really hard, it swells full of water and slides right down the slope. So it turned out to be a very bad idea. Uh, you can see the coronavirus there. We've talked about that. Uh, neutrina, where the, the critter in the middle was meant to be the fur coats of the future. And it was a big investment in the United States with new, neutrina farms everywhere. Unfortunately, neutrina don't do well packed together. Um, Manx do much better. Um, and so eventually the entire uh, economy of neutrina failed and some were set loose and they began clogging up waterways all across the United States. And they're almost impossible to, to manage and to take care of. They, you basically have to be hunted. And unless people want something, the hunting idea really doesn't work. You know, we hunted seals and mink and sea otters because we wanted them. Nobody wants neutrina anymore. And so they're pretty much out there. Feral pigs are another example. If you look down on the bottom left, this is the uh, species that I hear the most about, which is these giant snakes in Florida. And there's movies made about them. And uh, they are a big problem. And they're displacing all birds and all the other uh, species of snakes throughout the entire ecosystem there. So you end up with a monoculture of just one kind of snake. And how that plays out in the ecosystem of Florida, we have yet to see the real horrible effects, but eventually a monoculture typically collapses and you're left with nothing. Uh, beat the bull weevil. This is a slide from a previous speaker, uh, Dr. Brent Riffle, who talked about the African dysphoria and the, the migration of African Americans from the South to the North and to the West. And there was the push and the pull of this migration. So the pull was job opportunities and the push was things weren't so good in the South. And one of the things that affected African Americans who were the labor source for picking cotton was the bull weevil. As it decimated cotton crops, there was less work. And so that pressure of trying to get work drove down the value of labor and made it so that there was more and more people willing to leave. The bull weevil was a big part of the push for African migration out of the South uh, at 100 years ago from today. So let's review a little bit about this monoculture because most invasive species die out. 99.999% get moved, don't work. They come in on ships or they come in in commerce or inside boxes or anything and they just don't survive. But some flourish. And when they flourish in that ecosystem, it's usually because there's no natural predators and lots of food. So they eventually begin to take everything over, whether it's a plant or an insect or a mammal, still happens. And they, they outcompete everything. This reduces that resilience of the natural system, which is kind of what we're trying to get to with all this migration of species. And this system reduces the environment to a monoculture. And when there's a monoculture, you've got just one thing. And when a predator moves in because it does really well on that monoculture, it wipes that monoculture out and you're left with nothing. We create monocultures all the time. Industrialized farming is a monoculture. 
you displace what used to be hundreds of species associated with the prairie uh, flora and fauna, and you create soy. And soy is good for people. It's good for the environment. It's better than cattle. All these things we hear about it, but it still requires a monoculture. A monoculture means you've got to have pesticides because otherwise it's just a feeding ground for everything that wants to destroy the soil, uh, destroy the soy or whatever corn, name your product. It's still a monoculture. And finally, the area devolves into desert as we saw in the Great Dust Bowl, big problem there. There's lots of other factors in the Dust Bowl, but that was one of them. So the next generation of people have to live with this less robust natural system. In other words, an engineered system, a managed system. And they, they have to invest in this managed system. It doesn't happen uh, it doesn't happen naturally. So everything is this artificial thing. And of course that increases GDP. So GDP, is, it loves solving ecological, ecological problems because it's the movement of money and GDP is all about the movement of money without judgment. This GDP thing, also benefits from this ecological downcycling because now you have to provide resources which used to not cost money. And it's a very complicated problem. It has a lot to do with population, it has a lot to do with uh, societal preferences and things like that. There's no easy silver bullet on any of this, but boils down to it makes policy work to combat sort of the decision-making mentalities of today, those errors, it, it makes it impossible because of the pressure of money. So when the money's being diverted into those other artificial sort of natural systems, you have less money for education. And you know we are an educational institution. And so it does become more expensive because resources are being diverted. So those, these system conditions give us these three things. They give us clean air, clean water, and clean food. As those, conditions are violated, the system degrades and it costs money to manage it. Food certainly is completely managed now. Um, there's no longer, you can just go out and live off the, the woods and maybe that's good. Maybe, uh, maybe things are much better now, but the point isn't whether it's better. The point is the recognition that as that the systems degrade, you have to pay for what used to be uh, managed naturally by the environment. Water is increasingly needed filtration and processing, especially because of contamination. System conditions one and two, right? It gets into that, gets into the water. Air is currently not being managed. We try to prevent pollution in the first place, but we don't really pull pollution out of air and then re-release it. I mean, we've seen all that in the sci-fi movies, you know, on Mars or even in you know future uh, uh, planet Earth, but. But what if we had to pay for that air cleaning? How much money would that cost? And what effect would it have on society structure? I mean, certainly the GDP would love that. The GDP is not a person or a thing. It's just the movement of money. So because of those three, there's actually four system conditions, although we really don't need to worry a lot about number four. I just want to point it out that a society is not sustainable if it systematically undermines the people's ability to meet their basic human needs. Or as the originators of these system conditions explained it to me, if you don't, if you can't meet system condition number four, people will never try to meet system conditions one through three. They will simply plow through life to stay alive. So if you if we undermine clean air, clean water, clean food, then because of violation of these system conditions, then we end up with wars, we end up with water shortages, we end up with pollution, we end up with a lot of problems. And we don't usually blame, say, a, a regional conflict like what's happening in Ethiopia today. We, we don't blame that on system condition number one. You'll never see the LA Times write system condition number one was violated. And so therefore, you know, Ethiopia is having a war with a northern state and is close to civil war. You don't, you don't read about that kind of stuff. What happens is there are system conditions caused, whether it's naturally caused or human caused, there's no value judgment on that. It's just that there has been a systematic change and that's what causes those problems. And that's why number four has to be fixed or number one, two through three can never be solved. So let's bring it down to the iffy level, right? 
future people, those, the ability of future people to manage their needs, that system condition number four, that starts with the youth of today. And we're, we're an academic institution, like I said before, by definition, we are specifically chartered with creating a better future for youth or anybody at any age at a community college, but it's really creating that better future. And so it's in a little bit of conflict with the system condition, but we do what we can. So uh, review number one, under the crust, number two, new inventions, mostly chemicals, but not all kind of released out into the environment. And number three, that ecosystem robustness through that migration of species or degradation of the environment because of the migration of species. And uh, just so you know, I didn't make these conditions up. They were developed starting back as far as the 1990s. And there's been years of work to basically perfect them. A uh, Swedish oncologist started developing these. And he tells a fantastic story about how he kind of convinced the king of, Spain, uh, king of Sweden to, to make these like a policy for the country. And in this, he tells a great story about that. Um, but he was trying to answer the question um, of why children get cancer. Because back in the 90s, a lot of what we were starting to believe around cancer, and we're gonna have a fantastic presentation about, about this or a topic about it by Dr. Crude. But the key thing here is that why are they getting cancer if it's related to lifestyle choices? Because they're so young, we were talking babies. And so that's where he got into this and kind of happened. And the reason it never really has made it into environmental and social policy is because they're really very intangible. There's no instructions. Notice that it doesn't say don't create new compounds and release them into the environment. It's not a rule. It simply states that if you do that, there may be an unintended consequence. So nonetheless, whether they're tangible or not, they are the conditions that society rests on. You can't get away from that, even though there's not as much to do with it as you would like. So there, there's that next generation after those system conditions. But this kind of explains the idea of why this bring comes into this international form of youth. Because as we create, as these species you know, migrate because of farmers all over the world, they create these different environments. And as more and more of our commerce becomes digital, there's less and less of that. So I have to see what happens in the next 50 years. We may solve the problem of species migration uh, simply because uh, commerce is now digital somehow, and there's not very many exchanges of goods. And so with that, I'm gonna turn this back over to our hosts, uh, any questions, comments, or criticisms. Certainly, I, I appreciate criticisms because I'm always trying to make this presentation better when I get the chance to give this presentation. So with that, thank you very much. And I will stop the share. Questions? I have, I have a couple, um, uh, Tim. Um, you talked about uh, there are no instructions. There's no there's no you know, guidebook here, um, and and I think sometimes some of the things you're talking about seem overwhelming to individuals, right? Um, for a variety of reasons. So what what is and I, and especially what does a young person do? What are some concrete things that a young person do, can do um, to address this? Yeah. So I'm gonna. I'm going to punt that question a little bit, and I'll tell you why. So first of all, yes, um, these this can be a difficult concept because it can feel a little bit hopeless. Um, and that's kind of why I do that uh, initial warning at the beginning where I say, hey, you know, the planet Earth is old and there's dinosaurs will be out there because the planet has been here a long time and it's actually a pretty robust system. And nothing about what I've talked about really is too late. So what can youth do? So if you're young and you're wondering what is the world going to look like when you are, you know, gray haired age like me. So yeah, 
that happens. And when I look back to the way the world was when I was a kid, or even to go a generation before that, it wasn't necessarily a better place. So none of these things about the system conditions say that it's going to be a worse place. It just says it's going to cost money to manage things which are currently free. And so how much money is going to be involved? And the more money you have to generate, the more you violate the system conditions and goes like that. So I would like young people to just be aware of these concepts. There's no to do. There's no book. There's no guidebook. There's no tasks. But be aware of these concepts, because as a young person today, you're positioning yourself into that policy level spot of the future. And someday you're going to be making a decision about a policy. You're either working within an organization that is setting a policy, you're a politician voting on the policy, or you're a practitioner that is, say, on a nonprofit organization advocating for that policy. And I just want this lens to be part of your thinking of the many things that have to be challenged uh, in your mental, in, uh, in, in the current cultural sort of paradigm, have to be challenged with every policy. And if there's a opportunity for this concept of system conditions to play a role, I'd like you to remember it and put it to good use. Another question that comes up, you know, you, you're talking about invasive species and just the word invasive, you, 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 and it's not your phrase, it's been around for a while, but it, there's a value judgment to that, right? You, we're, we're sort of, um, we're, we're, we're making a judgment there. And I wonder, um, to what degree is invasive species just a natural phenomenon and, and is it always a bad thing? I mean, my tendency is to think invasive means it's an invader, it's, it's, it's pernicious, it's got to be stopped. But what, what, what are your thoughts on that? Is it always such a nasty thing? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So like I said in the presentation, 99% like of species which are introduced far away from their natural habitat immediately die out. But think of the jacaranda tree. We all love the blooms of the jacaranda tree. It's fantastic, it's gorgeous. It's also a species from Brazil, but we don't call it invasive. So the term invasive does couch a value judgment because if it's from somewhere else and not causing a problem, we don't call it invasive. But suddenly if it's causing a problem, we do. And so that's why the concept of invasive species is important because all the other species that are out there that don't cause an issue or the pets that when you release to the environment don't survive and it's you know, over, over 100 years now they haven't because commerce has really been going crazy over the last 100 years. Before that, it was much slower. So really it's just those species that end up changing. And the reason why it matters isn't because of the species themselves, it's because of the rate of change. Because typically at the barrier of a species area, there's a slow creeping back and forth of predator and prey. And as those predator and prey move back and forth, that line moves back and forth. And so what happens is if you take a species out of that barrier area and you pick it up and you plunk it way past that barrier, it's probably not gonna survive. I mean, it may not even have another member of its species to breed with. But if you tuck it up and it somehow does do well because there's nothing to stop it in the natural systems and there's plenty of food and a great environment for it, well, then it's going to thrive. And it's that, un it, amazingly, if thriving causes it to be considered invasive. Something about the way people are contributes to all of this. Because if we want something, and I alluded to this before, then we have a tendency to go take it. So if we decided, for instance, that, that eels in the Great Lakes were the best sushi ever, then we would decimate the eel population in the Great Lakes. And eels would no longer be an invasive species because we probably hunt them out of existence. So there's a there's a there's a effect by people that in the things that we do that degrades the ecosystem, and one of those things is the migration of species that we bring in. But another one is 
that extraction of resources from the environment that also, if, you, if done too fast, can degrade the system. So if you think about the terms you've read in the newspaper, like uh, sustainable fishing, well, that's all about not taking every single member of the species out of an area so it can replenish. And we talk a lot about that for uh, coral reefs. You know, don't degrade the coral reef to the point where it can't come back. So that's kind of how the invasiveness concept of species comes around. Good question. One other question that, that pops up to my mind here. Um, you sound, maybe I'm reading into this too much, but you, you sound rather optimistic about the future and about our response to these things. At the same time, you're, you're presenting some, some stark truths, I think. Um, but I wonder if you could share your thoughts on the rhetoric, rhetoric around climate or, or environmental um, conditions or, or, or degradation. In other words, are, are, are we being alarmist in the way we talk about the future, the way we talk about the environment, or is alarmism necessary to mobilize people? Or, or do you have a thought on that? Yeah, that's that's a really good question. The, the environmental, ecological sort of sustainability community really struggles with this because they sound the alarm, but but nothing happens very fast. And so it sounds a little bit like crying wolf. And, and even if you move past crying wolf and into sort of Cassandra syndrome, where you, know, you can be the predictor of the future, and then when it comes, uh, everybody's mad at you for not preventing it. Or if you don't say anything and it comes, they're mad at you for not saying anything, you really can't win. I am extremely optimistic um, for two reasons. One is, the other choice leaves lives uh, uh, leaves sort of a poor quality lifestyle for myself, you know, moping around that the the planet is coming to an end. And but I'm optimistic also because if you look through the recent past of the last say 1,000 years, I would say the bulk of humanity would agree that overall life is better now. Now, there's a lot of people right now that don't agree with that. I'm talking about the bulk of humanity. And if you look at change and the fear around change, CO2 is going to change weather patterns. Weather patterns is, are going to change where people can live. It's going to change property values. It's going to change insurance rates. It's going to change crop abilities. It's going to change the ability of people to feed themselves. But there's going to be other changes also. And we're going to move around. Um, something that was brought up, I remember one of the first times I ever heard this presentation, and I really wish I knew more about the source. And I'm not an expert on this. But I was told that there was a time when indigenous people very much were concerned about asphalt roads, because we were paving over the earth. And Gaia couldn't breathe. And so, if, you know, I'm, I'm not saying that that was alarmist, but it's an example of something people were really concerned about in, a, in some populations that it turns out it wasn't the paving, it's maybe what came with the paving that has been the big problem. And so I'm optimistic because I think that we will solve the problems eventually. We usually solve them in a non-preventative, sort of in a reactive standpoint, but we eventually evolve socially. And that evolution socially is rapid, unlike the biological revolution. And we can rapidly evolve our society to do things like clean the air. I grew up in, the, in Los Angeles with the worst air ever, and now it's so much better, it's unbelievable. I can hardly even tell it's the city I grew up in. And so I have a lot of optimism because I think we can solve the problem. I do think there's gonna be resources used that could have been put towards better use, but overall, we'll continue to march forward and we'll find a way to make the planet a better place for the majority of people. Other questions? Thank you, Another Tim. Question. Oh. Oh. Go ahead, Dr. Uh, Jay. Thank you. Because this is this is a forum for youth in terms of uh, what the issues that youth might be concerned about, and then, and then, well, we hope that we generate more discussion among my younger people. But um, my question is, you know, 
you talk about systems thinking. Unfortunately, I think in terms of the uh, higher education, we're still very much into the majors, right? Your majors, history, English, math. How do we as educators of higher education to promote systems thinking while our structure is very much kind of stuck in a way that still categorize things into separate pockets. So yeah. what is your thought on that? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm certainly not a pedagogy specialist of, at all, but I, and your observation is correct. We, we have a tendency to put together majors for the purpose of somehow launching a student from that major out into a lucrative career. And, uh, you know, most people like to major in, it seems like in things like computer science, where they've seen people launch themselves into being millionaires. It's sort of this, we're looking for that golden ticket. Um, but I don't, what I can offer with something like this is a very boiled down version of these system conditions. Kind of can be, it's, it's so tangible, when, it's so accessible, it's not tangible, but it's so accessible that this is a way that can be used to talk about what a system is that can make it so that students understand the concept of systems. Because I think the reason systems aren't taught and systems thinking isn't taught very well is because it's considered a very complex concept. And I think these three system conditions are very understandable. If you take stuff out of the Earth's crust and you sprinkle it all over the Earth, you're going to change stuff. For example, and you give you know mercury, uh, you know, and CO2 as examples. Uh, if you create new chemicals nobody's ever heard of, and DDT, and you spread it out there, something's going to change. You know, raptor eggshells. So, so you have this idea of saying it's a system, and we're changing the system conditions, and that's what a system is. So it's not a really complex custom, uh, complex concept. A system. It's very accessible. These can be examples of access as accessible system conditions. Then the system conditions associated with whatever's being talked about in that topic area can be used as that method for presenting all the facts and figures that you've got to have no matter what the topic is. So that students can start looking at things from a systematic standpoint rather than just from a task standpoint. I was taught math about mathematics from a task standpoint. You learned algebra, you learned geometry, you went back to algebra, then you did uh, trigonometry, then you did pre-calculus, then you, it was all this lumpy steps. And you had to do it in that order or you couldn't succeed. And I think if you understand the concept that mathematics is just simply a language and a system, you can leap all over all of those areas and succeed in math. And the same thing with history. History did not march in a straight line. History is a thousand things happening at once, all influencing each other, all part of a system. So one might say, for instance, on, the, on Dr. Riffle's presentation earlier about African migration, that the, the systematic degradation of the ability of people to be able to meet their basic needs caused a, mar a, migr a migration. So whether it was man-made or whether it was a secondary consequence like a bull weevil, or whether it was a way of thinking, because migration is about ideas, all of those things affected the factors which created that, that migration. And it was that systematic changing. It didn't just happen because somebody snapped their fingers and everybody decided we are gonna be against African-Americans and we're gonna kick them out. And then, oh no, they're all leaving. So now we're gonna force them to stay. Oh no, now there's too many, let's get rid of them. And so this, it was a systematic organization and cultures do systematic things also. The KKK was a systematic effort to make a societal change. So it all, everything boils down to those systems and it's examples like that that I think make students value the concept of a system more than just value the concept of a task, no matter which um, area of expertise they might be studying. When you went over these systems, it's really fascinating, but I wonder where, where do I go next? Where does the student go next if they want to read? Like, what are some of the bedrock writers or thinkers about this that have influenced you? 
Yeah, that's 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 a great question. So I'm I could go over the books that I've read and, and but most of what this is as far as contemporary thinking, because their basic system conditions is through a simple Google search of the natural step. And you'll find natural step networks all over the world. And they, they all are talking about these system conditions. If you wanna to go to a text that is probably your best tangible demonstration, it's a text called Natural Capital. And it talks about all the ecological and societal and so structural concepts in the environment, society, and economics concepts that, and how they interlace and how all of this plays out. Now, it's a bit of a dated text. And most of the texts on this concept are rather dated because it's, it was explored well, it was, it was established, and those texts don't have anything else to add until we start actually doing things about it, about stuff. And so right now, then that's probably your best, your best source. Thank you. Googling the Natural Step Network. Great. Thank you. Um, other thoughts or comments or a lot to chew on here, but other, other questions or? I had a, a comment, more like a, a story. As you mentioned, uh, air quality in LA. And I mean, I grew up in LA, but then air quality there was nothing compared to Mexico City where I have family and I've been going since I was a kid. And in the 90s, Mexico City air quality was awful. It was just, I remember we would go and there's like sirens going off when it was really bad. And it sounded like when you watch a World War II movie that there's like bombers coming. I remember I associated those two things and I was like, what's going on? They're like, oh, it's just air quality, it's bad. Or you would take a shower and you would wipe off like just dust off of your arms. And not that it's, a whole lot better now but it has improved a lot and it's as far as the system thinking it's like you have to have people that are in government and just people too that buy into how do we change it because mexico city is a ginormous city it's a, it's massive and it's old and there's a lot of problems but that's one of the things like kids grow up coloring the sky gray just because they've never seen it blue they think that's just how it is normally um and Going from like the 90s when I was a kid to now, it's like you go and you, see, you do see the difference. You see that there's uh, a lot more trees, especially um, more in the mountain areas or like um, to the mountain areas, there's like more tree planting. There's more within buildings or planting like balls of uh, uh, plants and different things that would absorb the toxins and, and help clean the air. But there's also the, what the government did was that certain cars couldn't circulate. Like if your plaque or your um, your car license plate ended in a certain number, then you, you could only circulate like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday or Tuesday, Thursday. Of course, the problem with that was that people ended up having two cars then because they needed to get to work every day. But they also improved public transportation. So there's some things that it's like public transportation improved, more trees on the ground, um, the government enforcing more or being more active in the participation. But I think a lot of these ideas ended up coming from the youth in the 90s and early 2000s. And they're still very much going on because the city's still trying to be, trying to do more, more beautification of certain areas and expanding more and more. And that's also helped a lot with their quality. Now, every time I go, I, I never hear those sirens that I did when I was a kid. And I also, you know, you shower, you don't wipe off dust off your hands anymore. So yeah. there is improvement. Is there room for improvement still? Yes, definitely. But like we were saying, to echo the things are getting better, at least in that sense, in Mexico City, things are getting better. Yeah, you know, that's, mm -hmm. that's such a great comment because Tim's talking, I'm sorry, Tim, but Tim's talking about the resilience of the earth. And when he says that, I'm thinking like a historian, I'm thinking, well, he means that in a thousand years, things will recover and will, you know, the earth will heal itself. And that's probably true too. But I think what you're both also talking about is, is that people can take concrete steps and in, in, in short periods of time, make positive change, right? I mean, this resilience is also very, very narrow, narrow, narrow time frame. Yeah, that's true. It is, I am thinking a narrow time frame. Um, as far as there is the thousand year view and the seven generations, which was very popular uh, in the nineties. Um, but uh, when it comes to sustainability, there's a balance and there's, 
it's a very complex formula. So two quick examples. We have time, so maybe not so quick. So two, two great examples. One is in Oregon. Um, there was a, in the 90s, uh, the federal government, because of the spotted owl, um, stopped the logging of old growth forests. It was part of this uh, trend to stop the uh, annihilation of species, and which is all basically wrapped up into system condition number three. But there's the environment doesn't ex the environment itself no longer exists all by itself. It is now directly linked to human society. And yes, it, it would do if we all disappeared, it would do fine. We've seen the movies of you know ivy growing all over the Eiffel Tower or the Empire State Building and lions running around. We've seen those things. But what it really boils down to is this, this general concept of when you change something, you have to respond. So the government responds. You're wiping out the spotted owl. The government responds. The secondary consequences are an economic change in the region. So the federal government didn't come in and really create uh, new jobs, enough of them. They did retraining programs and things, but you have to keep in mind, there's different people, different personalities. Some can change, some can't. And then there was this social consequence. So the environment, the economics and the social consequences of things are all interlooped. And the social consequences of that southeastern Oregon area was a huge uptick in domestic violence and alcoholism and bankruptcies because there just wasn't enough resources available to create the kind of change and support the change that needed to occur just to save the spotted owl. Now, we don't talk now today in the United States about that was a bad decision, but at the time, the state of Oregon and the Pacific Northwest in general was in an uproar. And uh, people weren't marching in the streets, you know, in black hoods and breaking glass, but there was a lot of politics associated with what a big mistake it is to try to protect one species over the benefits of the community. Another example is Ulaanbaatar in Mongolia. Mongolia is a kind of country where everybody really cares about each other. And they very much care about other Mongolians. And they work together as a country as if they were one tribe, which they are. And so the Mongolians send all the men out into the countryside and the women come in and become the teachers and the administrators in the city and the men are raising the cattle. And that's how the economy works because they don't have anything else. Um, and so when a big kill happens because of weather, which is happening more and more often, they call it the zood. When it happened more and more often, well, now there's not enough resources for all the men and they come into the city, but there's not always places for them to live. So they bring their tents. Well, it gets really cold in the winter. So they have to burn something to stay warm. And there's plenty of coal. So they burn coal, they burn trash, but people in the city, they're not attacking these homeless people in, in tents because they consider themselves all as one. And the air quality in Ulaanbaatar is absolutely the worst air quality I've ever seen, including me back in the 80s in Mexico City. So it's a really, really bad air quality and there's nowhere for it to go. And it stays that way for months. So you have this environmental degradation that happens. You've got these problems that occur, but, and you have this air quality issue and it's all caused because there's this interlinking between economics societal well-being and the environment. And they are forever linked together and can't be managed individually without a secondary consequence. If you want to stop the smog in Ulaanbaatar, you've got to get the tent people away from the city. If you do that, you violate the social code of Mongolians. So it's not going to happen. Now, what are you going to do? You got to find a solution. And they're still struggling with that because they don't have one. So those are two examples of that interconnectedness between those three elements. Yeah, it's it's incredibly complex, and 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 you've you've made that so clear. I mean, we could we could we could talk about this endlessly. Um, uh, 
and, and, and I love it too because it has it, it, it sort of has um, elements of everything uh, history politics culture tradition uh, obviously the environment science chemistry everything it's just it's really it's it's everything sort of, sort of rolled into one um, Thank you. I thought that was great. I love that topic. Uh, I, I think we could go around and around on that one. Um, anything else before we, we wrap it up for today? Okay, thank you again, Tim. I, that was fantastic. Um, uh, hope to see uh, everyone back at 5 p.m. today.